Okay, so we're focusing on answering questions to do with the court hierarchy and precedent. And from the examiner's report, the main things that the examiners say are weaknesses within candidates' answers are the following three points. Either candidates write a list of the courts minus any real explanation of the effect of precedent in each of those courts. Or secondly, the answers are basic and still devoid of any legal authority or precision of information. Or three, there's clear evidence of poor time management resulting in perhaps only one court being covered in detail. So make sure that you are aware of the weaknesses and that when you plan your answers, none of those three points can be found within your answers. Answering a question on court hierarchy, always begin with the Supreme Court, okay, so the highest court, and then work your way down the hierarchy. Okay, so before 1966, in the very famous practice statement which was issued by Lord Gardiner, this court was bound by its own previous decisions and it bound all the courts below it. Now, it was bound by its own previous decisions unless a previous decision made by them was made per incurium, in other words, was made in error. The practice statement 1966 meant that the Supreme Court could now depart from its own previous decisions where it felt it was just to do so. Now, even though they allowed themselves this new freedom, they also made it very clear that they intended to use this new freedom very sparingly, and they've lived up to this. It's not something that they've used often, and they haven't used it often because they want to reinforce the importance of certainty and consistency in precedent as two of its main strengths. Okay, a good answer will definitely support its information with key cases. So pause here and look up these two key cases. If you paused and looked up the two cases, then you would have found that British Railways Board versus Harrington in 1972 overruled AD versus Dumbreck in 1929 and the issue was on the duty of care that was owed to child trespassers. Now, the relevance of these two cases is that this was the first major use of the practice statement. So it's highly relevant information when writing about the Supreme Court. Now, two other cases worth looking up are R versus Shivpuri in 1986 and Anderson versus Ryan in 1985. So pause here and look up those two cases before you move on. Both these cases are really fascinating. R versus Shivpuri in 1986 overruled Anderton versus Ryan just a year earlier on attempting the impossible in handling stolen goods. This was the first criminal case in which the practice statement was used. OK, so the Court of Appeal is the next court below the Supreme Court. It's divided into two divisions, a civil division and a criminal division. And what's worth noting is that these two divisions do not bind each other. Now, decisions of the civil division are binding on all civil jurisdiction courts below it. It also binds itself. Decisions of the criminal division are binding on itself and criminal jurisdiction courts below it, except it's not as strictly adhered to as it is in the civil division. And this is because the liberty of an individual is concerned. R versus Spencer is your authority case for this point.
As a general rule, the Court of Appeal is bound by its own previous decisions and it binds the courts below it and it is bound by the Supreme Court. Now, you know how the Supreme Court has the practice statement? Well, for the Court of Appeal, according to the case of Young versus Bristol Aeroplane Co. 1944, which laid down, this rules, down these rules, the Court of Appeal can depart from its own previous decisions where faced with any of the following three situations. So it is bound by its own decisions, binds others, is bound by the Supreme Court, unless faced with the following three situations which you are going to see next. And those three exceptions, also known as the Young exceptions, are Firstly, if a previous decision conflicts with a later Supreme Court decision, then the Court of Appeal must follow the Supreme Court decision and abandon its own. Secondly, if there are two conflicting Court of Appeal decisions, then the Court of Appeal must choose between them. And thirdly, if the decision was made per incurium, i.e. the decision was made in error. Okay, and please also note, in addition to the young exceptions, that the criminal division of the Court of Appeal has one more exception. It can depart from a previous decision where it considers that that previous decision was wrong and it will do injustice to the defendant. Okay, so that's one more exception that is available to the criminal division of the Court of Appeal. Okay, so a key case to support the information that we've looked at so far, so a key case for the Court of Appeal, could be this one, Family Housing Association versus Jones in 1990. Now, in this case, the Court of Appeal felt they didn't have any choice other than to ignore a previous Court of Appeal decision because they conflicted with a later decision made by the Supreme Court. So you could use this as an example, showing... Um, courts in action. Okay, so the High Court is our next court and it's bound by the courts above it. This court has a dual jurisdiction. It is a court of first instance and an appellate court. As a court of first instance, its recorded decisions have got to be followed by the lower courts, but they don't need to be followed by other High Court judges. These decisions are considered highly persuasive though, and therefore they tend to be followed. Okay, so remember we're going to look at it in its dual jurisdiction. So this information about is about the High Court as a court of first instance. When the High Court sits as an appellate court, both the lower courts and the High Court are bound by the appeal decisions issued by the divisional courts of the High Court. Now remember, you know that a High Court division is sitting as an appellate court when the words AL are at the end of the division. So family division will be the family division sitting as a court of first instance. The moment is a it is a family divisional court, it's hearing an appeal case. Now the young exceptions also apply to the High Court and please note the following, that the exceptions that apply to the criminal division of the Court of Appeal also apply to the criminal appeals that are heard in the High Court. Let's now look at the lower courts, these being the Crown Courts, the County Courts and the Magistrates Courts. And these lower courts do not set binding precedents, although please remember that the decisions of the High Court judges that sit in the Crown Court may be persuasive authority if they are recorded.
Okay, now that we've gone through the information in this video, you've done some background reading, I hope, before you took a look at this video. You've um, gone through this information, go through it again if needs be. And the next thing to do is to have a go at structuring your own answers. Now, please make note of the weaknesses that were identified at the start of this video about what the examiner's report said about weaker answers and avoid those pitfalls. Over the next few, few, few slides, you'll find two past paper questions that dealt with this topic. One dealt with it by um, linking it in with how judges also avoid precedent, and the other one was a half question, okay, linked in with obit edicta. Both those two questions will follow with some guidance, and then you'll see um, actual images of those past papers. Please do have a go. You know that you reinforce your knowledge better by having a go at the questions and do them under time constraints, please, in order to replicate a realistic examination situation. Okay, so in order to answer this question, you're going to be using information from this video as well as information on how the courts generally tend to avoid having to follow precedents. So I would advise you to refer to each court separately. Make sure you use cases to back up your points. When you cover the Supreme Court, you know that you're going to need to mention the practice statement of 1966 and the power that the Supreme Court has to overall distinguish or disapprove precedents from a lower court, make sure you use cases either like British Railways Board um, versus Harrington and AD versus Dunbreck or Shivpuri and Anderson and Ryan. For the Court of Appeal, they have the powers to overall distinguish and disapprove um, precedents from a lower court too and make sure you mention the young exceptions and again use cases to support your answer. For a question such as this, it's, um, outline what is meant by the terms hierarchy of the court and obita dicta. Now, this will tend to be a 10 mark question. What you need to do is divide your answer between these two areas. Okay, so when you're outlining the courts, outline them from top to bottom. You won't be able to include every single bit of information we've included in this video, but make sure you save who binds who, why there is a need for the hierarchy, make sure you mention the practice statement for the Supreme Court and the young exceptions for the Court of Appeal and the High Court. Deal with the High Court maybe in a little bit less detail, followed by the lower courts.